Thank you very much. I realize that everybody is now very eager for lunch and their minds are probably turning to things other than what I want to say, but bear with me and I'll try not to make you too hungry except for results. <laughs> now, I have multiple citizenship, as you might say, in addressing you today. I speak as Chancellor of the University of South Wales, an office which I'm very grateful and proud to hold, also as head of a college in Cambridge, and as chair of the Cambridge Trust for Commonwealth and International Scholarships. So these issues about access, about modes of learning, diversity, about the whole future of higher education globally are issues that are constantly in my mind and my heart. And in my last job, I had the unusual experience of laying the foundation stone for two universities in Africa. One in Mbere in Kenya, one in Bunya in the Democratic Republic of Congo. These were university premises rather different from the ones I remember, and rather different from the ones most people are familiar with. They were, and they still are, very basic facilities indeed. They represent not so much achievement as hunger, a real eagerness for quality education as part of a whole liberating program for the people of a country. And that's why for me it was so very moving and so very apt to hear Mary's words read out just now, because they rang so many bells with me in conversations I have had, especially in Africa, over the last decade or so. In a while, I want to say a little bit about one particular project that I've been involved with in Cambridge, because for all the great difference of academic context, there are, I think, a couple of learning points well worth taking on board from that. So I'll come back to that in a moment. But I want, first of all, to underline what has already been said by many people this morning about the needs of Africa. Africa, whose immense economic resources are barely beginning to be developed. Africa, whose immense human resources are barely beginning to be developed. Africa, which is and ought to be a challenge to the conscience of the rest of the world. Africa, which some people a decade or more ago were saying should be written off in terms of the economic future of the globe. Africa, to whom the rest of the world is in so many important ways in debt, I believe. We often talk about the debt of developing economies. To developed economies, there is another kind of debt, and it is moral and social and educational, and we had better wake up to it. Africa's needs don't really need to be underscored at this point. What we see in so many contexts in the African continent is a deficit in a number of crucial areas. A deficit in good governance. A deficit in active and independent civil society. A deficit in business initiative. And a deficit in financial transparency. None of those four things is a matter for finger-wagging or moralizing from here. Because, you know, in terms of business initiative and financial transparency and all those other things, we have a few questions to ask of ourselves and the rest of the world also. But they are conspicuous and challenging in Africa because they stand in the way of the humane and constructive development of sustainable human societies. So when we talk about higher education in the African context, we are talking not just about a way of getting more jobs for Africans or more money for Africans. We're talking about how we remove some of the obstacles to good governance, flourishing civil society, business initiative, and financial transparency. We are looking at higher education as a tool for the creation of sustainable society. And I think as soon as we've said that, it ought to be clear that we can map that back onto higher education much more generally bearing in mind that higher education is not there simply for the job market, it is also for sustainable societies, 
It's also for the education of citizens. I'm sorry, my colleagues from the University of South Wales have heard me say this so often that they're probably very tired of it. But maybe, maybe there's somebody in the room who hasn't heard me say it before, so I'll say it. We are in the business of educating citizens, educating people who can ask awkward questions of their societies in order to maximise the potential of all fellow citizens. So when we talk about extending the opportunities of tertiary education in Africa, we're talking about a very ambitious project indeed. Rightly ambitious, but ambitious not simply to tick a few boxes, but to discharge something of that debt to Africa that I described. The rest of the world has over the centuries done quite well out of Africa. It's time Africa did quite well out of the rest of the world. And we, in turn, will have things to receive and to learn as that goes forward. Now, I've talked about, about, about Africa's needs and the deficit that afflicts so many societies in the African continent. But we need to balance that by thinking about Africa's possibilities and Africa's resources. I needn't, I'm sure, elaborate on the wealth of resource represented simply in the continent itself. And one of the great tragedies, of course, is that some of the most resource-rich countries in Africa are some of the most poor in terms of governance and sustainable development. But I want also to underline something that's already been flagged up this morning, and that is the way in which the digital revolution has already arrived in Africa. One of my greatest surprises and delights on my first visit to Kenya was to discover exactly what cell phones can do. To discover the massive percentage of banking that is now done through cell phones in Africa. And to put on yet another of my hats, I'm also chair of the trustees of Christian Aid, a major international church-based development organization. And a great deal of what we now do in contexts like Kenya is connected with disseminating information to farmers, for example, through digital technology. The cell phone which will tell the local farmer when the best times are to sow at a time when climate prediction has become so much more uncertain. So we actually have a ready audience there, a ready public familiar with some of the technology that's needed. We're looking towards the building of sustainable societies and that means, of course, that the education we seek to share in the African context is going to involve quite a lot of those things which do build sustainability. Not just business skills, but economics and law. I think it's extremely important to underline the need for a legally literate society. And I believe that what we've been talking about this morning is key to that diffuse, differentiated, multidimensional, to use that helpful word, approach to building society, which will not just be, as I say, about getting people into work, but about equipping people to ask the questions that will unleash further capacity. The practical challenges about access, about quality of education, the difficulties of getting information about sometimes over-complex academic processes across. All of these are challenges which I think are beginning to be met very effectively with some of the vehicles that we've been hearing about this morning. And I'm delighted to see so much thought, so much creativity going into cracking those problems about access and quality. But it is important to remember that when we speak of nurturing and developing a better higher education sector in Africa, we mustn't isolate that from all the issues, the interlocking issues of education and social development in the continent. The challenges are not only about access, about quality, but also about what I'll call hinterland and expectations. People make the most of higher education when their hinterland, their deep background, and the expectation they come with is something that has prepared them for the best that they can receive in the higher education world. 
So I just want us to bear in mind that there's a bigger map around education and social development that we have to bear in mind there. I want now to say just a few words before I, um, before I stop and allow you to go to lunch about the project that we've been involved with in my college in Cambridge. And as I say, I'd like to draw out two particular things which I think might be of relevance for framing the discussion as it goes on. Rather surprisingly, the late Nelson Mandela was an honorary fellow of my college in Cambridge, thanks to the imaginative initiative of one rather unusual member of the college a couple of decades ago. A college which used to have, um, I'm sorry to say, a rather ingrained reputation for conservatism suddenly found itself with one of the greatest revolutionary figures in the globe as one of its honorary fellows. It breathed deeply, swallowed hard, and made the most of it. And one of the first things that happened was the setting up of a small number of Mandela scholarships in the college. Now, these were not very well endowed, and the process of recruiting to these scholarships became, over the next decade or so, really quite complicated. They were restricted to South Africans, and in practice very often restricted to South Africans already from a rather privileged elite background, a problem which again we flagged up this morning. When Madiba died, we decided as a college that one of the best things we could do as a memorial for him was to re-endow and, to use the technical academic term, reboot Mandela scholarships. We decided we would raise some money for a longer term and more generous endowment, that we would extend the scholarships to the whole African continent, that we would proactively look for partnerships on the ground which would enable us to extend the scheme with foundations, banks, and so forth, and that we would attempt to set up an ongoing network of scholarship alumni who would keep the word alive and spread it around. And the two bits of learning from this, which so far have come home to me, I'll mention now. We're still in the process of raising the endowment we need for this, but I think we're well, well on with it. And we're also, just in brackets, trying to raise an endowment for um, a professorial chair in African studies at Cambridge in memory of Mandela. That's another story, but quite an exciting one. We realized, first of all, that in the current climate, we couldn't, even as a relatively well-known Cambridge College, just depend on our reputation and on our alumni's generosity for funding these scholarships. And so we began to look for partnerships. We began actively to look for foundations with an interest in broadly developmental issues. We found that Standard Bank in Africa <coughs> and one or two other groups, the Orbis Foundation, Investec, and similar organizations, were only too eager to share in the work we wanted to do, both in funding scholarships and, I would say just as importantly, in keeping the profile of these possibilities alive. But the second bit of learning <coughs> that really did impress itself upon us, and I think this is particularly relevant to some, some of what we've been hearing in the last half hour or so. The other thing was we realized we had never made the most of those who'd been through the experience, using them as ambassadors for what we wanted to do. And I'd like to say that in thinking about developing online possibilities for higher education in Africa, we need to think not just about current students, but about the alumni of whatever processes we go through. Mary's letter, read out to us just now, was exactly an example of that. Somebody who had benefited and who wanted to let others know about that. And I'd like to think that in the programs and schemes we devise and deliver, we keep in mind the need to encourage people to network through digital media in such a way that there will be both a spread of information about what's possible, and even some sorts of informal mentoring to raise expectation, to accompany people in what can be a very unfamiliar and difficult environment. I was delighted to hear about learning centres, because that seems to me 
exactly on target as part of this. And to think of such learning centres as part of that wider vision by which we seek to ensure that people don't walk alone in this context, that I think would be a wonderful aspect of this general vision to develop and to run with. So, although what we're thinking about in terms of our scholarships is, in some ways, a more old-fashioned model than what we're talking about today, it's forced us as a college and a university to think about how best to communicate, how best to make use of people who've already been through the programme, how best to make use of what partnerships are available. But it's also left us with exactly the question that once again has been flagged up this morning. How do we make this a genuinely interactive, two-way process? How do we think about a program which will not just be about, as you might say, unloading the benefits of Western culture onto poor, benighted foreigners? Because that colonial model is still very pervasive. We need to think about how the process of engaging students from other cultures and other backgrounds becomes an enrichment for the institutions we belong to. We need to make sure that it's not a one-way track, because that too is part of the building of a sustainable global society. If we're thinking about building towards developmental goals in Africa, towards good governance and vigorous civil society and business initiative, and financial transparency, we are thinking about something that has global implications and interlocks with what we would hope for our own societies, our own civic future. So that's a very rapid and afraid, rather superficial overview of the situation I think we're in. But I would like simply to end by refocusing on those two main points which I think emerge from what I've been talking about. First of all, we are looking towards the building of a sustainable future for African economies and societies. And secondly, we're looking for something that is not just an us and them relation, not just a del ton bar relation, but something which contributes to a vigorous global society and which is capable of making the best possible use of the most important resources we have, which are our students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Right Honorable and Right Reverend Lord William of Oyster. And now, we would like to invite everyone for lunch in the dining lounge for a superb meal prepared by the excellent chefs of the Langham Hotel.